Okay, so I'm going to unmute myself. This is awesome. I keep turning on the banner. It keeps turning off. <laughs> I got an angry cat in my lap. Like, everything's just working this morning. International. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the future of conferencing right here. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're, we're, we're uh, embrace the future. This is, uh, <laughs> this is awesome. Um Ah, hey, see, any host with a cat is the best host. Thank you. Um, I'll try to get a kitten on at the end of this session. Um, here, hold on a minute. Wait a minute. <clears throat> yeah, complete professionalism. Ah, that's what we're doing. So let's do the next talk. It's 730. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the, the yeah, the future of uh, uh, future of conferences. I was trying to bring a kitten up here. And I'm glad I don't have to try and compete with a kitten. My, my talk is not as awesome as a kitten. Yeah, it just it's amazing. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh okay wait a minute somebody wants to hear about the cat this is kit kat <laughs> kit kat's old and angry um so uh we have christopher arco up and christopher where are you located at now currently are you where are you yeah um, i've actually been uh, living for the last 13 years in an inuit community in the canadian high arctic i'm calling in from cambridge bay nunavut uh also known as ikaluktotiaktok and um, this is one of the, uh, uh, I, I suppose to just put it on the map, a couple of years ago, I went to a conference in Fairbanks, Alaska, and I was the only person who traveled south to get to the conference. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so, man, that's great. So Christopher's going to talk about this morning. We've got a uh, GIS integrated with virtual reality, and he's going to have examples from uh, the Polar Knowledge, uh, the Canada High Arctic Research Station. Uh this is the best bio, accidentally born with lungs instead of gills. <laughs> Chris is a lover of marine worlds, uh, wields data and computing to fulfill his dream of reestablishing a balance between humanity and the oceans, guided by Inuit culture and the high Arctic community. He's called home for 13 years. So that is awesome. And uh, I tell you what, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, we will get started. Yeah, I'll just uh, share in a moment. I'll introduce myself on camera here. Okay. But thank you, Randall, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. It's 5.30 a.m. in my local time zone. And uh, what I'm looking to share with you today is my adventure of integrating GIS with virtual reality that has taken place over the last three years. I'm going to demonstrate some real applications of GIS VR integration that have been used at the research station. And I'm hoping to equip you with the knowledge necessary to do this yourself if you see the merits of this. Uh, one last point, um, in response to speaker guidelines, I have disabled the videos from this presentation. I've replaced them with a couple of stills. Uh, hopefully the imagination can cover the spread on the stuff that's there. And um, I've also deviated a little bit from uh, the uh, description of the outline only because this was at one point thought to be a workshop and then turned into a talk. So let me get my slides up here and that should get everything going there. Red, ah, excellent. Okay, so I'm still on the screen here. So uh, that's, uh, that's the first bit, moving on. <clears throat> so uh, briefly, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, quickly about myself. Uh, that's me when I'm out on the land on the left there. So I'm an environmental scientist and a 30 year veteran of wielding GIS tools. Uh oh. I see a little spinny thing. Uh, hopefully the slide's still there. Um, uh, so uh, 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 I, I, I go back to uh, eight, and eight inch floppy disks and ARC info. So uh, I'm currently working in data science and I'm the lead of scientific data and computing at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. I'm concerned, I've got a message here that says uh, I'm having trouble connecting. I'm not sure. I'm you're going to assume. Yeah, give it, oh, yeah, I see Randall kind of popping yeah, back in you're, here. You're coming through fine. Yeah, everything. Everything's coming up fine. I see you're quickly about myself. This and, behaving oh my, at all. Nope, you're good. 
At least on my end are good. I will jump back out. Trying the chat window. Can you hear me? Randall, am I active? Can you, can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear I can me? hear you now. Did I okay. wink out there? Uh, you may have, but you're. I, I can see everything on screen, so you, I think you're good. Okay, very. I'm going to continue. Car pardon me. Uh, we have some of the worst internet connectivity in the world up here. I'll just continue. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's about me. Uh, but the Canadian Higher Arctic Research Station is Canada's newest research facility in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, up at a latitude of 69 degrees. And there's lots of ways to talk about the research station and its objectives and what it does. But I say its purpose is to improve the lives of northerners around the globe through science. Let's move on to the GIS stuff. So I'm guessing I've got an audience here that's very familiar with geographic information systems. And one of the things that I've found with GIS over the past years is that GIS places users of data above an environment. It's detached, you're in this omniscient, dare I say, godlike position above these data. And uh, I really care about this detail because as an environmental scientist, my responsibilities are not just to properly communicate factual data, but also to get people to care about a subject. And that's hard to do when you're towering even six feet above, you know, a bunch of ants in their little world. And I needed a way to break through this limitation that was imposed by common GIS view, uh, viewing and interface tools. Oh, Christopher. Uh oh. So Christopher may have just bounced off the... Uh, uh oh, he's back. Are you back? I got the boot there, Randall. I don't know what happened. Uh, yeah, no, um, I think this is my bandwidth. I've got a contingency. I wasn't planning on this. What I'm going to do is instead of sharing a whole screen of PowerPoint that's uh, high uh, high resolution, I'm gonna share my window. You'll get to see all my horrible speaker notes and everything, and uh, hopefully that'll reduce the bandwidth associated with what we're good. doing here. You are, you are good. I'm bouncing back out again, so go for it. Proper. Okay, Randall, if we can uh, pull up the PowerPoint window I've got there. Excellent, all right. Let's see if that reduces the load on the system here. So um, uh, what I needed to do to get people inside an environment uh, to immerse them in the data and change the frame of reference was presented by virtual reality. Uh, it changes the frame of reference for the user and the data from on the omniscient to the participant and it dissolves the user data divide. You're no longer hovering above it, you're actually within the data. And this is superior for a couple of analyses, including watershed analyses. Uh, I'm just gonna show one frame of what was um, uh, uh, originally a video that we used when I introduced people to virtual environments. And that is of a Tyrannosaurus that's looming over you and just, you know, terrifying with its jagged teeth. And that often, uh, like that, that I think helps convey what it's like to be a participant in environment as opposed to an omniscient overseer. I've got a very easy slide here. This is a deliberate black slide for imagination time. And uh, when we have visiting researchers come to the research station, what we need to do is familiarize themselves or familiarize them with our uh, field camp. So just close your eyes or look at the black slide for a moment and imagine that I say, you've arrived at the field camp and 30 kilometers north of here, we've got um, a small facility in the field. It has uh, two structures and there's uh, you know, a, a mountain to the north and you need to park the boat at a very particular spot. Now, any amount of simply conveying information that way doesn't really equip you for success. So let's take a look at what you can do with a virtual environment. Think of how different a picture is from those 10,000 words. And here's a screenshot from the virtual reality 
the interface we have to a GIS which manages our field camp. Now I've gone and introduced a number of artificial components to the scene, such as the sign that says, welcome to the CHARS IMA or intentions intensive monitoring area. And in the virtual environment, you can look around and move around and see objects in this space. And here's, oh, I'm going to wait for uh, the little circles to catch up. And so here's a number of stills from the video I had that shows somebody walking through this environment. Let's compare and contrast that to a more traditional above-down GIS view. Uh, you're just disconnected from the environment in this case. So what we're looking to do is to break down that barrier and virtual reality is the tool. So what tools do we wield to get this done? So now I'll be talking about the free and open source GIS VR tool set. I've compiled uh, a series of resources because now that I work as uh, a lot of academics, everything is false. Uh, like when I was in the private sector, uh, you could always spend money on software and such. And now that I'm surrounded by researchers, they're all poor. It's horrible. I wish they were better funded. But you wield what you can. And not only that, I have found that these tool sets are in some ways superior. So the 3D um, environment for modeling uh, that I propose for you is Blender XR. So it's a fork of Blender, which is a 3D creation tool, but it's specially made for virtual reality. And uh, it supports a number of commercial head-mounted displays. There's then a plug-in for this called Blender GIS. And this ends up being a Slide, if it's coming up for you now, gives a series of links that'll allow you to access those. And I can also provide those in the chat window uh, if you're, yeah, yeah, I see I'm breaking up again here. It's good, man. You're back now. So what I did was mute your video. Yeah, Randall, it's not giving to... me uh, feedback as to whether or not things are going well. Yeah, that's uh, good. Just going to uh, proceed here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, keep going. You're so good. the big first big challenge uh, that happens is how do you interface GIS data and GIS data formats with uh, tools that were not developed for GIS? So we start to look at Blender compatible file formats. So the native abilities of Blender to import data are presented in the left column here, but I've draw drawn attention to two, the Collada and the Wavefront OBJ. And that's because I have had the greatest success in moving GIS data into these virtual reality tools using Wavefront uh, OBJ format and Collada DAE. I'm surprised that VRML didn't work as well because I thought that for sure that would have some cross compatibility, but it's not a row, uh, it's not a rigorous enough standard that everybody's kind of using their own flavor of it to get going on there. The Blender GIS uh, extension also allows for some pretty phenomenal uh, import tools, including shape files, uh, so vector data, which is a very, very common unit. Uh, a very large suite of raster image data format, but most importantly, GeoTIFF DEMs, which would provide basically a surface for you to start draping materials all over there. And then lastly, there's the Blender phot Photogrammetry Importer. There's so many file formats that that opens up that I've just got it at that tiny little block of text. That just becomes one of the most useful tools for, again, migrating GIS data into a virtual authoring environment, okay? And now I'm going to talk about the biggest problem that I've had making this succeed. And that is specifically that GIS tools are very, very eager to use the units that we function in. And that is uh, coordinate systems like UTM. And the VR tools 
limit themselves greatly in the uh, dimensions of the Cartesian system that they can apply to an environment. So you're actually limited to about 10,000 units, which kind of equate to meters, depending on how you're wielding the tours. And uh, take that in, in comparison and contrast to a UTM coordinate system, where these offsets can exceed that. My what UTM Y coordinates for my home are around seven and a half million, which puts us well outside of that boundary. And the way that I've successfully and reproducibly corrected that is by defining a site-specific UTM zone where the origin is actually close to your region of interest. So that's overcome the majority of the issues that I've encountered here. Uh, let's move on then to talking about two other applications that have been successful in moving the GIS world to VR and then more importantly then back into the GIS environment. I'm going to show you a slide here from a collaborative environment that was built on the same research uh, uh, field camp. And what I've got shown here are a series of C containers or C cans that were proposed to be placed into this environment so that we could have both storage and shelter there. One of the nice things about a virtual environment is that you can manipulate that environment in any way you want at extremely low cost, usually the cost of dragging around a slider before you do any active work in the real world. I'll go back to uh, onto the next in a different manner. So after moving all all this GIS data into a virtual environment, we can start to manipulate that environment. And even better, you might have seen references to the Blender multi-user plugin earlier in the slides. And what I've actually had set up is two people, one from our operations team and one from our facilities team, in this virtual environment at the same time. And together, they can discuss what the ideal placement of these C containers are and develop the environment. Once that's all done, we can move proposed solutions back into a GIS environment where we the GIS functioning then as a uh, uh, a uh, as-built or you know model proposal for uh, the outcome there. Um, uh, so there's just one more example of this. Sorry, I realized that my time's getting close here. So I wanted to close on one note here. I know this has gotten quite sparse compared to the uh, outline that I was there. It's just a final note. Uh, Blender as an application has a reputation as being challenging to learn, and that's the most uh, generous way I can say that. that. It, it's it's reported to be brutal, but that's not true anymore. Uh, that really uh, was resolved with uh, the development between version 1.8 and 2.8 of the application. And many old users didn't like the change, but the interface is now really quite easy to learn. Um, it's not uh, the uphill struggle that it used to be. There's you know a lot more ease associated with getting into there. So, and if you have a real hard time with it, there's actually another fork of Blender called B for Artists or Blender for Artists. You can go there and get what is supposed to be the most user-friendly interface available for that. So just uh, taking a look at the two minutes I've got left to talk, uh, I just wanted to mention in summary that virtual reality can take users from being omniscient and overseers of an environment to being integrated and associated with it. It gets people more involved and gives you a better understanding of an environment, can contribute greatly to a health and safety program, is highly accessible through free and, free and open source software, in particular Blender and Blender GIS extensions, and it allows you to uh, collaborate on site development and data management in an environment where people are uh, a part of the data as opposed to independent of it. I'm going to end the screen share now because that seems to be brutal on the uh, connection. Uh, how much of that came through? <laughs> Man, that was pretty. Am I coming through? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I got you now, Randall. Okay. Excellent. That was good. No, most of that came through. You broke it. It was. 
you broke up a little bit, but you know, you're you're broadcasting from the high Arctic, man. You gotta it's it is what it is. <laughs> I, I'm waiting for the Starlink system, man. That's supposed to solve all our problems. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing I'm sitting here looking to see if you have any questions. Um have you tried uh got it? Got it? G O D O T versus got it comparisons? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tool that we're wielding. So, um, uh, 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 the reason I haven't rigorously applied got it is because, uh, we're just in the infancy of, uh, I, I'm at the stage where I'm presenting to the research station and the researchers, the fact that we can do this and what its immediate applications are. The things that people latched onto were our health and safety program and our facilities management. And so that actually gives you a very limited window of the tools you can wield. Um, uh, we just want, uh, so that becomes part of our future exploration when we're refining our processes. It's certainly part of the experimental suite, but not part of our ratified suite. Ah, excellent. So how, okay, so I got questions. How do, oh, you, good. How do you handle, so you're, you're up, you have sketchy internet, software updates are a pain, I assume. Um, you, you know what I run? I run a sneaker net. I, you guys aren't going to believe this. The internet oh, yeah. is so bad here. I have a small computer. It's about this big and it sits in my parents-in-law broom closet down south. They happen to be in a town on a fiber connect. I take remote control of the system, download like a madman. Every two weeks, they stick two memory keys into that computer. I load them up. They drop it into a envelope, mail it to me in Canada Post. And when I, uh, they're two one terabyte sticks. And when that comes up here, that represents $6,800 of over bandwidth charges uh, in a month. So uh, yeah, that's just the way life is until uh, we get better connectivity. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? Oh man, no, oh, I've, man. Worked oh, man. Areas, I've worked in low bandwidth areas, and that's you got to be creative. You got to be creative. Yeah, um, yeah. So we got another question. So, so have you carried out any study groups any study using this groups VR tech with indigenous VR people? With indigenous if so, how did that go, and what are they gaining their experiences? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, I don't know who asked that question, but here's somebody who knows the environment. Absolutely. Um, not only that, uh, we're looking at the applications of this for preservation of cultural artifacts and archaeologic digs. So one of the things we've got, and you saw the products of drone photogrammetry, and you saw me talking about um, uh, 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 open drone map. Imagine an archaeologic excavation where after you erode a series of layers, you're constantly uh, recollecting imagery of the site as you move down to that archaeologic excavation. And then you get a slider in the virtual environment that becomes either depth or time, depending on how you're looking at it. So we've already explored applications for cultural preservation with this. And uh, yeah, like that's a real fusion there. I, I, I don't even know where to begin talking about all the potential applications applications we have for, um, I mean, uh, and, and people seem to love this. Uh, we've got, oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so lost by the sheer number of concepts that are flooding to my head where we've talked about um, uh, applications for preservation and development of Inuit culture that involve VR. Uh, the VR is kind of the one thing, the GIS does play into that. And, and it's like uh, that one thing I was talking about archeology span and moving down through layers is where the GIS meets VR, which is why I presented that one. But yeah, don't get me started. That's a four hour conversation to talk about the <laughs> other applications. Man, that's awesome. Um, yeah. It does appear. So that was probably the last question. So how, okay. Another question. We got a few minutes, like a couple more minutes. Yeah. How did you end up in the Arctic? So you said originally commercial <laughs> life and then you ended up up there and then I heard father in-laws. So I'm assuming uh, marriage was somehow involved or, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my wife sent me up here. So uh, yeah. the, the last place I was working prior to coming up here was uh, in uh, Northern Alberta doing uh, environmental remediation of oil and gas spill for 
you know, uh, raw material and product. And I kind of got tired of that game and took a year off. And in my year of bumming around, my wife found uh, this opportunity for, um, it was a uh, three-year contract to come. And I actually did develop the geographic information system to manage and administrate all of the Inuit owned lands of Nunavut, which is actually more area than the Holy Roman Empire at its largest, oh, wow. uh, and basically built the GIS to administrate Inuit owned lands. I then trained a number of Nunavut Inuit to run and administrate the system and then left that organization. So I thought I was coming out to hammer out two years of a three year contract, and that was 13 years ago. Uh, I stuck with that first organization for eight years, took a year off to uh, go out on the land and, um, you know, uh, uh, just experience all the wonder that this environment has to share. And then I joined the Hieratic Research Station about four years ago. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, man, that was excellent. Um, current temperature? Uh, oh, uh, it's starting to be regularly uh, icy here. Um, we've had snow every day for the last month. And uh, the ice is starting to freeze. So it's generally hovering around minus one, minus two. It's when the ocean starts to freeze that, you know, it's cold. Ah, that's the good stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Christopher, thank you. That was good. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah, very quick. But, uh, oh, um, uh, you can find me if you go, uh, just look up Christopher Arco on uh, the Canadian government GED S GEDS tool. And if you'd like to contact me with anything else, by all means, I'd love to hear from anybody. Excellent. Well, good deal, man. We will uh, yeah. take a very small break and then come back with Mr. Hughes and make this work. All Excellent. right. Have a great day, everyone.